All right, good evening, everybody. Thank you for joining us tonight to hear one of our newest board members, Tiffany Pereira, talk about soil seed banks and her work as a science illustrator. We're particularly happy to spotlight a new board member this year working in a terrestrial environment. I'm Lisa Collins and I'm the president of SCAS. On behalf of the board of directors, I welcome you tonight. We're excited to have you join us for the second year of this series, spotlighting our board members and their research and contributions to science. We set out creating the Spotlight series last year to increase our members' connection to SCAS and to show you the value in continuing to support SCAS in our mission. Last year, we had over 300 people tune in for the series of Spotlights. For our guests, if you enjoy this talk, we encourage you to join SCAS. Your membership supports scientists and students in Southern California. Students are eligible to apply for research grants, which are due in early spring, and SCAS supports student awards at our annual meeting as well. Members of SCAS also do not page, page charges when they publish in our uh, peer-reviewed journal, the SCAS Bulletin. We hope to see you all at this year's annual meeting, which will be held in person at Cal State Fullerton on Friday, May 6th. We are all extremely excited to see you again and in person. <laughs> Registration will open in early 2022. Please check the SCAS website for more forthcoming information. I'm pleased to introduce our moderator tonight, Matthew Tang. Matthew is an alumnus of the SCAS Research Training Program. He joined the program in 2015 and, intended, and attended two AJAS conferences. Matthew is currently a senior at UC Berkeley studying electrical engineering and computer science. He will be headed to Google to work on the cloud AI team after graduation. We're excited to have him join us tonight for this talk. Thank you for being here, Matthew. Thank you for the introduction, Lisa. SCAS was definitely a big part of my high school career and the research experience definitely helped me gain research opportunities in college. I'm honored to be here tonight to introduce Tiffany Perea, who's an assistant research scientist at the Ecologist Desert Research Institute and one of the new SCAS board members. Tiffany is an ecologist and scientific illustrator specializing in the flora and fauna of the desert Southwest. For the last 10 years, she has worked as a wildlife biologist and botanist in the Mojave and Great Basin Deserts. Currently, her work involves conducting research and providing guidance on natural resource management in Nevada. During the talk, if you have any questions uh, during the presentation, feel free to drop them in the Q&A section and we will address them at the end. And with that, I will pass it off to Tiffany. All right, thank you so much, Matthew, for that introduction. Let me go ahead and get this screen shared. And as a fun fact, I'm in my green room and so I do have some dart frogs in here. So if you hear birds chirping, that would actually be some of my dart frogs in their tank who pick the most unopportune times to um, get croaking. So let me go ahead and share screen. Okay, I think we should be good to go. So once again, thank you all for joining me this evening. I am super excited to be a new board member of SCAS and to be here tonight to present some of my work to you all. Uh, I am a native of Southern California, born and raised and have been living in Nevada for the last 10 years. So I have a fond affinity for the Southern California region. I need my ocean therapy every now and then, so I enjoy coming back, but the desert has definitely been my home now um, for many years. And with that, I'd like to take you on a journey here, um, talking about soil seed banks and go on that journey from a scientific and an artistic standpoint. So let's get going. So hashtag Superbloom, I'm sure you guys have heard that thrown around in the media, on social media, in the newspaper, LA Times, New York Times, in the springtime when the flowers are blooming and Southern California, particularly our gorgeous state flower, um, California poppy displays are often a very large part of that media craze. We get hordes of people out 
to see these gorgeous uh, orange blooms that can be seen as in this image um, from NASA satellites. And it's absolutely stunning. And we get that across uh, not only our Southern California landscapes, but our desert landscapes as well. And oftentimes um, people don't really think about the mechanisms behind that super bloom. What actually drives those annual wildflower displays? What creates that phenomenon? And the answer to that is actually buried, hidden in the soil, comes in the form of seeds. And not just seeds, but seeds that are present beneath the soil surface. That's known as a soil seed bank. So these seeds are beneath the soil surface or at the soil surface and they are capable of germination. That means they are viable. Only viable seeds are part of a soil seed bank. And soil seed banks can either be transient where there's a annual turnover that goes on or they can be persistent where those seeds actually remain, excuse me, dormant in the soil for upwards of 10 plus years. And we call that a persistent soil seed bank. And you can think of this as a way, a mechanism for plants to store their genetic material in case there's a bad growing year, a bad drought, or something that prevents them from germinating. And we had evidence of that last year out in the Mojave Desert region. Unfortunately, Vegas in 2019 had no monsoon season for the first time on record. That coincided with 240 days without measurable precipitation in Las Vegas. And as a botanist going out uh, in 2020 during the spring wildflower season was dismal. I have never gone out and seen no annual flowers, annual wildflowers at my study sites. And that wasn't just something that I was witnessing just in the Las Vegas region, but also botanists going around in the greater Mojave and Great Basin regions were noting a lack of wildflowers and even the perennial plants looking pretty, pretty bad. And so how do our desert species combat that zero year, that year when nothing comes up, where they're not able to set seed? And that answer lies in the soil seed bank. So those seeds lay waiting for the right conditions. Sometimes those conditions only happen years at a time. And in the event of a zero year, those genetic little fingerprints are what prevents these species from going extinct, what, it, what allows them to persist and continue across time. So soil seed banks are increasingly important, increasingly uh, important to study, and it's one of my focal uh, research topics. So there are knowledge gaps, however, in the temporal and spatial understanding of soil seed banks. And when I say temporal understanding, it's, um, within a year or several years across a growing season or droughts. And that spatial understanding occurs at different scales. So you have microsites, specific plants, all the way up through different soil types, special soil types, um, communities, biomes, environments, and so forth. In fact, most of the work on soil seed banks has actually been done um, in gypsum communities specifically have been done on the in the Iberian steppes of Spain. But we have gypsum communities here and it would be nice to not only have more long-term studies, but studies that are done in rare plant habitat and rare soil habitats. And that is what I had an opportunity to do. So in 2007, um, my former advisor went out into the Mojave Desert, in the Eastern Mojave Desert, to these rare plant gypsum communities, and he conducted a study across 10 field sites out near Lake Mead National Recreation Area. And 11 years later, I had the opportunity to go out and resurvey those exact same sites, those exact same transects, 
and was able to compare those results. So it's a rare long-term um, seed bank study opportunity. And those pictures that you see, 2007, 2018, are actually repeat pictures um, from the same location and same orientation uh, looking down the transect. And it gives you a little bit of a clue as to the results. Um, so you can see those, some of those shrubs are the exact same shrubs. So a little hint there about some of the results we'll be getting at. So the features of the study, um, first of all, gypsum soil. So this is a rare uh, special soil type, uh, calcium sulfite dihydrate forms these lovely gorgeous crystals on the soil surface and a very difficult crust. There's a lot of talk about, and not controversy, but some differences in the literature about what creates a plant that is gypsum tolerant. That is, it's a gypsophile. Is it its affinity um, and its tolerance for the sulfate, calcium sulfate? Is it its ability to actually grow on that hard crust surface, combination of all the above? And just how specialized are these plants on this surface? So with that being said, the study also features two rare plants that grow or have an affinity for gypsum soil. So we have Arctomicum californica, that is Las Vegas bear poppy, and Anulocollis laesolinus, that is the sticky ring stem, a little hard to see in the picture, has these large basal leaves, uh, long stems, really interesting flowers. It's a nighttime bloomer um, and pollinated by nighttime moth and has these sticky rims that not really sure what they're for, but possibly to prevent um, insect predation. We also are going to be looking at the fertile island effect. So if you go out in the desert, oftentimes you can note that there tends to be a lot more growing under these larger shrub canopies. And that's a thing that is called the fertile island effect. These larger shrub shrubs create a microsite under the canopy that allows for more moisture. The roots allow for more nutrient buildup and therefore a microhabitat for plant growth. So my study questions. First off, do comparative analyses of soil seed bank data from 2007 and 2018 reveal long-term change in soil seed bank composition? Two, can we associate so seed bank change, if there is change with above ground vegetation change in those rare plant gypsum soil habitats. And finally, which of our tested soil seed bank characterization methods better predicts that change? There are several ways of um, analyzing a soil seed bank and we'll get to those in a little bit. They both have their pros and cons um, and are both different and instrumental and in depending on what results you're looking for. So here are my project locations. As I said, all in Lake Mead National Recreation Area here in Southern Nevada, uh, except for one site that's on um, Bureau of Land Management owned land in the adjacent Rainbow Gardens. So these are all uh, rare plant gypsum and soil habitats. These permanent transects have been in the ground sated with rebar uh, for the last decade and more. It's always a fun job to go out and play find the rebar, which we do when they're staked in about an inch above the ground. So we have these 50 meter transects at which we collected replicate samples, uh, soil core samples at zero to five centimeters of depth. You can see the little um, core that we used. Fun fact, um, jalapeno cans from Albertsons are exactly five centimeters in depth and seven centimeters in diameter. I know because I was in Albertsons in Boulder City with a tape measure measuring jalapeno cans so I could create cores for myself and people gave me the strangest looks but I walked out of there with 20 cans of jalapenos. Um, so we collected these cores at six different microtype sites, again, to get at that um, fertile island effect. 
So we had, of course, our two rare plants, Sticky Ringsome, Las Vegas Buckwheat, or excuse me, Las Vegas Bear Poppy. We had White Burst Sage, Ambrosia Dumosa, Ephedra Mormon Tea, Ephedra Toriana, and Sorothan Mystery Montii or Indigo Bush. Uh, we also collected from the inner spaces between those shrubs, again, to look at the differences between those microsites versus those open inner spaces between. Now for our soil seed bank characterization, characterization methods, we first have the emergence method. It's one where you basically bring those cores back and you put them on top of soil, you put them in a greenhouse and you let them grow and you see what comes up, what emerges from those soil samples that you brought back. Um, and as you can see, they're very tiny when they do get going, but you pull them and you ID them and that becomes the indicator of um, your seed bank. Uh, the advantage here is that it ensures the viability. Um, seed banks, as I said, must be viable seeds. And if it's growing, that means it's viable. So the disadvantage is that you can't physically provide everything the plant needs uh, or different species needs. So in the greenhouse, might be getting too much water for some, might be getting too little water for some. So you're gonna miss seeds that just don't germinate in those conditions. The second method is called the extraction method. So rather than <laughs> growing out the seeds um, in a greenhouse, you physically remove them involving a painstaking method of sieving the samples, pulling the seeds out um, under a microscope. I had lovely technicians helping me with this and hours um, physically pulling seeds and using different guides to ID these seeds to species. And again, painstaking practice. The advantage is that it's relatively faster without the needed germination time. Disadvantage, um, the task of removing the seeds using flotation and then a drying oven can sometimes damage the seeds and therefore you're left with kind of questioning the viability of those seeds. Finally, we did collect vegetation uh, samples or sampling across the transects to be able to compare the seed bank densities to the above ground vegetation. So using our lovely meter by meter um, quadrat and our P et al cover classes for that. So with that, get into some results here. So comparing the main effects influencing change over time for each of our method, we did have microsite affecting emergence, but both year and microsite affecting extraction. And here you can see Ambrosia demosa is significantly different um, as a microsite against everybody else. And that tended to be a trend wherever it was significant. And we did have up to a 25 fold difference in seed densities between microsites. And this is corroborated by some of those studies in Spain with steep seasonal seed bank turnover in those gypsum soil communities. Pretty exciting. We also had differences in the life history groups. So I'm talking about annual seeds, or seeds of annual plants versus perennial plants. And once again, we have our Ambrosia dumosa, significant here for the microsites for both emergence and extraction. And for annual seeds, however, it was the year uh, only and only for extraction and varying reasons um, for that. There's a lot of connections between the size and shape of perennial seeds versus annual seeds and which ones tend to form persistent seed banks versus which ones tend to form annual seed banks that get turned over more frequently. And it's, we'll get to the scientific illustration part of my talk where 
looking at the seed morphology itself might start to get at why um, some of these turnovers and changes are what they are. So we also have long-term uh, seed bank and vegetation relationships. So we did find a correlation at both the microsite scale or microsite and site scale in terms of species presence absence. So which species are present or absent uh, in that seed bank composition, the seed density. So how many seeds of each of those species and the species richness. So how many different species are present. We also, when comparing the two methods of seed bank characterization found that extraction is a much better and more reliable predictor of that change. However, as I noted, we still have that issue of viability to contend with. And once again, here are some of those repeat photography. My advisor, Scott Abella, was very much into photography and taking pictures and said, why not repeat those pictures? So again, you can see just um, top to bottom, some of those perennial plants are still present on the landscape. It almost looks the same. So here we have an example of where extraction is correlating with the 2007 extraction to 2018 extraction, and not only over the long term, but within, excuse me, 2018 above ground vegetation. So within year extraction to above ground vegetation and across years, 2007 extraction to above ground vegetation. And even with the seed bank methods itself, the extraction is correlating with similar results. And this is not usual. It's quite rare um, to have that correlation between the seed bank density um, and the above ground vegetation not only occur within year, but long-term as well. There have been some studies done on a shorter duration, but this would be one of the first that would be a longer duration. So again, we're seeing extraction. So this is at the microsite and site scale. We're seeing extraction and extraction and the vegetation correlating strongly with each other in terms of density and species richness. Again, unusual. And lastly, when it comes to species detection, uh, we had 10 taxa identified in 2018 exclusively, while 19 were detected in 27, 27, 2007, but not in 2018. We did unfortunately have exotic taxa, so invasive species, like Bromus rubens, Malcomia africana, and then our invasive grass, Schismus. I wanna point out the Schismus specifically because its number went through the roof between the years sampled, unfortunately. Strangely, we also had Typha, so that's cattail, that's a riparian uh, species come out in our gypsum seed bank. There are springs and seeps in Lake Mead, as well as the lake itself. Um, so again, just a interest, when you do seed banks, just an interesting um, mechanism of how far these seeds can travel. If you've ever done any work in repairing areas, you come out with typha just covering you and it's a fun time. Um, we did test the viability of all our extracted seeds, uh, finding that 37% of that total seeds that were tested in 2018 were viable uh, versus 11 percent in 2007. Unfortunately, ev I, I, I did this myself so I, I remember, but every single schismus seed was viable and it was really annoying. <laughs> they were all viable, all ready to go um, if they got the right nutrients and right conditions to grow. 
So conclusions and broader impacts here. Um, we found that long-term spatial and temporal differences in the seed bank composition and density. However, the relation to the gypsum above ground communities maintains those strong spatiotemporal patterns. And it's really cool to see that even though there's that turnover that could be seasonal, that could be long-term turnover, it's still correlating to that above ground vegetation. And I'd like to go back, um, do a three point um, data collection, go back out there maybe this coming spring or following spring and take that third uh, sample point. If anyone wants to come and take soil cores with me, <laughs> I need to recruit people for that and or the extraction. So with that, I'll move on to the second part of not only my being, how I define myself, but also the work that I do, which involves scientific illustration. Um, I was a fine arts minor in undergrad, and I kept that with me through what I do now for a career and find that you know, not everything is just cut black and white. Um, there, that art can creatively and powerfully convey scientific fact. So what I set out to do is create a unique guide for Mojave plant species using traditional and contemporary scientific illustration techniques. So just a little history on scientific illustration itself. It's not a new practice. It's actually quite old, as old as um, beginnings of scientific exploration itself because a lot of these early researchers they didn't have fancy um, smartphones uh, memes social media or even uh, computers obviously to document their findings and send it out to the rest of the world or their peers they relied on writing and on illustrations to convey their findings to the rest of the world and to document and preserve their work so a lot of these older you know, researchers were often scientists and illustrators combined. And if they weren't, they found people to go and depict the findings for them. So much so that scientific illustration is actually deeply entwined with the discovery and progress creating the foundation of modern research today. Because some of the most important advances in both medicine, biology, were made possible and preserved through these hand-rendered illustrations. And as I said, uh, not every scientist can be an artist. So people like myself, we love to help out with those um, that need help with figures, graphical abstracts, and a lot more uh, journals are recognizing uh, the importance of conveying findings in a way that can be accessible to a broader audience and we're here to help or of course you could you know end up with something like this which i personally think is fantastic this is a real figure scientific illustration from a real um a real journal article and it makes me happy i want it on a shirt don't have that yet but i want it um but nonetheless if this isn't what you're going for, we're here to help. So my concept for my work was to develop this novel identification tool for these desert seeds and young seedlings. When going through the emergence method, we often had to let them get to a certain height or growing stage in order to formally ID them. And I started keeping track of them as they grew. Um, so taking really detailed pictures of the cotyledons. So those are the embryonic leaves that come out first and then they're followed by the first true leaves of the plant species. Uh, this gorgeous illustration um, comes from Joshua Tree National Monument when it was still a monument someone decided to try and illustrate the first true leaves and the cotyledons of some of the annual species out there and I thought that's a fantastic idea Let's do it. So merging art and science, communicating scientific results to a broader audience.
and here they are. So this would be Ambrosia dumosa. And what I did was to pick them over a 10 day period with the scale. So some of these I can now ID just from the cotyledons in the field to species because they are unique. Um, granted, I'm working with a very specific flora. It would be fun to uh, take this further to pick more of them, but it was a good resource for me to go back out when I was resampling and to be able to ID species just from those tiny, tiny parts of the plant. This is wing cryptantha. Again, very unique features. And some of them are indicative of what they'll become. Some of them look entirely different, <laughs> like the, this is globe mallow. But as soon as those true leaves come out, this is globe mallow. But again, very tiny. That's a one centimeter scale for that. So good for me for the emergence to be able to ID them as quickly as possible. This is Rotson Suncup from the Primrose family. And finally, a favorite in the Mojave, the Desert Trumpet, Eriogonum inflatum. No inflated parts just yet when it's growing. But what I also did was go through, and this would be called a contemporary scientific illustration method. Um, people often ask me, why do you draw the specimens? Why do you illustrate the specimens in black and white, in ink, um, when you can just take a photo? And the answer to that is that with an illustration, you can convey texture a lot better. You can convey different panels of different sides. Um, you can showcase different features, whereas with a photo, it would be hard to get all of that in focus at the same time. Um, however, with advances in different photography techniques, um, there are there is what we call now stacked photography or stacked microscope photography. So you have a mounted camera to a microscope, a compound microscope and you take pictures at different depths. So you focus, take a picture, focus again, so on and so forth till you have the whole thing photographed through. And then there's software that you can use to actually smush all of those pictures together. And you wind up with a photograph that is focused all the way through. And that's what you're seeing here. So. I photographed 27 families, 120 different species. Uh, most of them came from my work um, and some of them came from one of my mentors, Todd Eskew from USGS out here. He had a box of seeds sitting on his desk from his PhD thesis that he was like, I wanna do something with them. I was like, give them to me. And he did. So 200 species here, all photographed using that new or newer method. And you can still get a sense of the texture. Um, I would say it's still easier to discern from a black and white drawing, but here you get the color, you get the scale, they're beautiful. So we have differences here in, um, these are both Phasalia species from the Borage family, Cranulata, to the right, palmeri below. So these are in the same genus, but look at how different um, those morphological characteristics are. And seeds often end up becoming an indicator of what species it is. So sometimes you do need those seeds to uh, define something to species. So we have, they're very different, but you have that little pock marking. Um, it's a phasalia. But you have others, here are two different Mensalia species. Um, one on the right, one on the bottom. The right, I like to call um, the fried egg. That did, the top one is actually from, directly taken from a plant. The bottom one came out of my seed bank. So lovely to find that intact in the seed bank 
um, to be able to pull it out, know exactly what it is. Uh, the one on the, the one to the left or below, uh, referred to as the little um, brain. So again, same genus, but unlike the Vesalia, is quite starkingly different and beautiful in a way, delicate in a way. And these different characteristics may have something to do with either their turnover or their persistence in the soil seed bank. Uh, for example, with the Las Vegas bear poppy, they believe the seeds are dispersed by ants that actually eat the attachment point, the hilum of the seed, but they leave the seed intact. They move the seed, consume the hilum, but they don't ruin the seed. And that's part of the ecology of that plant. So unfortunately, we have our invasives, um, Brassica torifoniae, uh, Sarah Mustard on the right, and our lovely Schismus on the bottom. So I pulled a lot of Schismus out of my seed bank collection or cores. And the way to tell if they're viable is you wet them a little bit and they get all like a mucus kind of forms and you know they're viable. So they're like little gemstones, but you know exactly exactly what they are when you find them. And finally, I'll end with probably my favorite seed or one of my favorite seeds. This is Castileja. This is Indian paintbrush. Gorgeous honeycomb structure. And I just find them fascinating. You know, these seeds hold the genetic material um, for their future uh, progeny, <laughs> as, you, as you will, you know, when people, you see them pulling out flowers during the super bloom, crazy. Um, and it's like, what's five flowers, they say. But those five flowers have 10 seed pods, those seed pods, have how many dozens or hundreds of seeds and those seeds do not get to become reproductive members of their community. So there's this compounding effect. I actually had to explain that when it comes to soil seed banks um, when these events go on. And these little tiny, tiny jewels are the key to longevity and life in the desert and for all the species that depend on the plant communities for forage, for shelter. Think of the zero year with that lonely tortoise out looking for forage, nothing for him to eat. And if that keeps happening, then we get to having problems. But in the meantime, we wait for those right so or right conditions to activate these soil seed banks, either on an annual basis, like our California poppies, or on a multi-year basis for some of the species that require something a little bit special. But it's good and comforting to know that these soil seed banks exist. They're there, they're lying dormant, waiting in the ground. And we as humans, when those conditions are right, it's beautiful and it's special and get out there and enjoy them and know that there's secrets <laughs> digging in the dirt, ready to be discovered. So with that, I would like to thank Skaz Vord for inviting me to talk, inviting me to be a part of this community. I'm excited to make more trips um, back to Southern California and visit with everyone. I'd like to thank the Desert Research Institute and all my colleagues there, UNLV School of Life Sciences, where this work uh, took place. And of course, Drs. Um, Todd Eskew and Leslie DeFalco, Abella Lab, Lindsay, my field crew, and my lovely undergraduate assistants that helped me with all of this work. Also, I have to thank all my pets because I have too many of them. With that, I will take any questions you may have. And thank you for your time. And as Tiffany said, uh, we'll be opening it up to Q&A now. So uh, please drop your questions in the Q&A and I will get to it. So first question is from Shauna. Uh, apologize if I butcher the names. Uh, so she says, these beautiful desert seeds strike me as very different from a typical seed. 
if there is such a thing. Can you comment on the morphological characteristics that may relate to the seed remaining viable in such harsh conditions, whether temperature, aridity, or soil and soil mineral composition? Mm. Could you repeat that last part one more time? Yeah, yeah, sorry. Uh, no, you're you, fine. It's can you comment fine. on the morphological characteristics that may relate to the seed remaining viable in such harsh conditions, whether temperature, aridity, and soil mineral composition? Yes. So there are studies done that correlate persistent seed banks. So the seeds that form seed banks that tend to last longer tend to be seeds that are small and compact versus ones that there tend to be more turnover tend to be seeds that are larger, longer, um, flattened, or just in other words, elongated. So there are these mechanisms help in their dispersal. Uh, but they can also either aid or be a detriment to how long they survive in the soil seed bank itself. And some species don't rely as heavily on a soil seed bank versus some that do. Like the Las Vegas bear poppy, that one relies very heavily. That one's a, it's a technically a perennial, but it's set seed like crazy like it's an annual so it's a little bit of a weirdo and it's tiny little seeds reflect that they're small for a perennial plant i don't know if that answers your question but there have been some studies or there's some conjecture as to what makes it turnover versus what makes it last longer all right yeah thanks tiffany oh uh, yeah again feel free to follow up uh if you have any additional any any uh yeah additional things to about that but yeah let's move on to the next question uh it says <laughs> we have an anonymous attendee that says omg that's a lot of pets with two exclamation <laughs> marks yes i have a lot of pets so i do work with both plants and animals um so i do a lot of work with reptiles as well and the amphibians are yeah it's just a slippery slope like I had some frogs and now I have more frogs. So I do help with relic leopard frog surveys um, out at Lake Mead as well. So people try to get you to say, are you a plant person or are you an animal person? And I emphatically say both <laughs> and upset them. <laughs> but I work with tortoises, I work with um, snakes and and when you really get down to it, you can't separate the plants and the animals. So here I am. Yep. And then next anonymous attendee says, first and foremost, thank you for your presentation. It is fascinating to see art and science in collaboration. My question is in regards to professional development. What advice would you give to undergrads who are looking to go into your field of work? Good question. So. I would say, I guess, so I, when I did my undergrad, I thought I wanted to go into advocacy and law and found very quickly when I started interviewing for those jobs that it just wasn't for me and I found field work and I, I loved it. So just, I would say if I had to do that over again, just take the classes that have that field component, just try to explore as many different things as possible. And just like with the science and art, um, explore multiple passions. And sometimes there's a way to combine the two where you don't have to feel like you have to choose one or the other and it's all or nothing. Um, just try to merge those if you can. And then also get out and volunteer with local um, agencies often, or at least out here, the Nevada Department of Wildlife has, and Park Service have volunteer opportunities, um, Audubon Society, just so you can get to know those land managers and what they do and where they survey, where they work. 
Great. Um, next question is from Edith. And they said, have you looked at variability in seed dormancy levels produced by one plant? I'm thinking of annual stages, uh, parentheses, saliva, so, sorry, so, salvia SPP. Uh, I don't know if uh, you know what that is, but uh, yeah, yes. that is an example. Uh, that produced a range of seed sizes. Yes. Um, so what's the question about have I looked at dormancy? Is that... uh, yeah, seed dormancy okay. levels. Yeah, so I haven't dealt with salvia species specifically, but um, another part of the work that I do is seed germination and seed ecology. So that is looking at what gets a seed to crack, as you will, um, and break that dormancy. It can be a lot of different things. So I, I've done a lot of work with Las Vegas bear poppy. Um, so that one specifically, it, it's never been propagated in a greenhouse setting. I've gotten them to germinate quite well, which is astounding, um, but haven't gotten them to get past that germination stage, that first stage. So we know that most likely, I need to do more work on it, but most likely it requires cold, wet, and possibly repeated cycles of cold and wet to break dormancy and have a good year. And in, in the field, people have only reported that they say like every 10 years, the bear poppy will have a banger year and there'll be a bunch of new seedlings. Um, so 10 years is a long time to wait for a mast germination event, but all seeds are, or all species are different just because cold and wet works for a bit. Bear poppy doesn't mean it works for everything. So. Sounds good. Next question is from an anonymous attendee who says, do you expect this research to be long-term or short-term? And is it financially expensive to do this type of research? Are there a lot of people involved in this research? Yeah, so I would like to get one more Good question. I would like to get one more, like a third point. Um, this is nice. You have one point, two point. You need that third to kind of connect the dots. Um, I don't need it. I would like it. And it's not too, it's not, I mean, I went out and got jalapeno cans from Albertsons to use as my, my soil cores, but it does take time. I have a seed germination chamber. I have the sieves, uh, it is, it does take time to, and time is money, I guess. So um, be able to recruit volunteers or hopefully pay um, technicians to help me out with this work. That's how I like to do things today. It's, um, you know, actually employ technicians to help me with my, my research. And it's nice not being a grad student, I can do that, but it does take time. And it's not, I'd like to continue the work with soil seed banks in general, maybe not with just the gypsum communities, but other communities as well. Um, also with sol some of the solar plants that are going in, they wanna do weird things where they're gonna keep the vegetation, they're not gonna mow it. And looking at soil seed bank interactions in that kind of scenario, so keeping with the soil seed bank research, but expanding it outside of these gypsum communities. And then also keeping with the seed dormancy uh, research, but expanding it further than just the focal species I've been working on. And then a related question is, how much was the estimated total cost in this project? Hmm. That's, that's an interesting question. Um, hard for me to come up with numbers, numbers on the fly. Uh, I guess when I did it, this, the first go around, um, I kind of funded myself. It wasn't, wasn't too much, but I didn't have to pay for like the seed germination chamber and all of that, but mm, several grand. Sorry, it's, I, I don't know if I can come up with the, I think with that's the number on the fly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. oh. yeah. 
Next question is uh, Lake Mead has Lake Mead itself has dramatically dropped in water level over the years. How does this affect the diversity of the nearby seed bank over time? And what can we expect for future plant diversity in the area? And what about dormancy disruption? That's a good question. Um, that was one of the things that I kind of, like that drop in the, the cattail taipa detection from 2007 to 2018. I wondered if that had to do with the water level receding further back away from some of my study sites. Um, but there are also springs nearby. So that kind of um, adds some variability there. I, to really answer your question, it would be good to compare the seed bank of areas that are now not submerged and see what comes out versus the upland um, seed bank and compare what they look like. And if some of those, if it's just destroyed <laughs> from being underwater and now it's not, and now it's being recolonized by plants and they've done restoration, is the restoration successful? So those are interesting thoughts. I haven't looked at that specifically, but that could be done. In fact, I think one of my lab mates might've been looking at that in Glen Canyon. She has not published those results. So I'm not sure um, what she found. Thanks. Uh, next question is, uh, how many people would be involved in the actual research? Uh, for Seabank, there were, it was myself, and I had three technicians that helped me very exclusively for going out and taking the veg cover and taking the cores, um, people like getting out. So I had some friends come and also assist me um, with taking the cores. We did, I didn't go into it very detailed, but we took replicate samples. So each microsite had three samples taken and then each microsite, there were three microsites. So it was um, a larger effort to get those soil cores and then a way to combine the cores and, and all of that. But it can be done. Like I'd like a team of five to give a concrete answer. I think that was good to have a field crew and then the crew helping in the lab. All right, next question is from Lisa, and she says, do you personally prefer taking photos or illustrating, and why? Ooh. And which is more time intensive? I love illustrating. Uh, I love taking pictures, too. Um, it's just, I think there's a reason why botanical illustration persists with the line drawings. You still see them in the Jepson. You'll still see illustrations in medical books. Um, textbooks, those kind of references. It doesn't have to be hand-drawn. Um, you can do digital illustration. I myself am starting to get into that a little bit more or I hand-draw and then I'll scan it in and then I'll enhance or create a graphic on Illustrator or Photoshop. But usually there's a, um, a hand-drawn component photography, I end up taking a lot of reference pictures for what I do, but I do like repeat photography. I think that's its own kind of um, method of analyses, even just having these different pictures taken at different timestamps. So the stacked photography, I also think is, is beautiful. And I'd like to continue that work it's just a matter of getting my hands on seeds, lots of seeds. I know Rancho Santa Ana Botanical Garden um, had started a, they have a pretty vast um, seed picture collection. I would like to see scale with them. That's my only qualm, but they've been doing a fantastic job of getting those up on there. Mm -hmm. All right, next question is, um, how does your work impact, I guess, like? the larger society as a whole? Mm, my goodness. Um, I think for 
land managers, it helps them understand uh, what they're dealing with, with the resources that they have to, like in Lake Mead specifically, they manage their bear poppy populations, their gypsum soil communities. And these some of these communities are ones where there's active mining. Um, and to use bear poppy as an example, just because there's no plant above ground does not mean it doesn't exist in the seed bank. So then you have questions of the developer goes out there, they're doing a biological survey prior to construction. They're like, oh, there's no bear poppy here. It's fine. Uh, there's never really any thought to whether those seeds are still present. They just haven't bloomed yet or haven't germinated yet. And so it raises some questions about how we conduct land conservation, management, planning. And when it comes to the art side of things, um, I think now more than ever, uh, scientific communication and proper scientific or communicating science in a way that is accessible is so important. Um, gaining that level of trust, not just existing in our, our silos, um, speaking to each other, using our own jargon. Um, I think it's increasingly important and art is one of those common languages. Um, why not utilize it? And it doesn't have to be fine arts in the sense of drawing, um, but just thinking about scientific communication in a different way. All right, I'll kind of lump these two together for the to have one more question. Um, so where in the world, I guess, like is this type of research uh, being done and like what would be the goal, I guess? Yeah, so trips and communities, a lot of work has come out of the Iberian Peninsula in Spain. So I, there's a whole gypsum world community. I don't know how big it is, but people contacted me when they heard about my work and they were really excited about it. There's like White Sands Monument in, um, or National Park now in New Mexico, which I still haven't been to, but as someone who has worked with gypsum communities, that's like a Mecca. It's like dunes of gypsum with very specific flora. So there are other people working on this, but it also, it's not just gypsum. There are also other special soil communities around the world with their own sets of flora that are important, just as important to work on well, with plants that sometimes don't occur anywhere else. All right, I know I said one more question, but there is actually just one more. I think it's a fun okay. one to end on. Um, okay. This one that asks, do you have a favorite visual artist? Also, do you listen to music when you're out in the field? And if so, any song recommendations? So I guess I listen to music, I'll answer the music one um, first. I do listen to music when I'm in the truck, when I'm in the field hiking around. I tend not to just because I like to, especially if I'm kind of in the middle of nowhere, I like to hear nature, what's going on um, and just be aware of my surroundings. Um, but in the truck, it's a party when I'm, off, when I'm off roading to the site. And favorite visual artist. Oh my goodness. I haven't had to think about that one in a while. One of my professors at UN or USC when I was there, Justin Bua, I really like his work. So he's a good one. He was a good teacher and just kind of urban, contemporary, but fun. So that would be that. Yeah. All right. And with that, um, thank you, Tiffany, for your insightful talk. And thank you, Lisa, and uh, the whole board for coordinating this webinar. And uh, thanks to all you, everyone, uh, all your attendees for coming out here and all the great questions. Yeah, I appreciate everyone. Thank you so much for joining me on a Thursday night. Thanks everybody. We'll be um, announcing about having some more spotlights later this year and highlighting some of our other new board members and people we haven't heard from um, 
and we'll be doing that in uh, in then 2022. So thanks everyone. Have a great night. And this recording will be posted on the SCAS website in the next couple of days. Take care, everybody. Bye. Thank you all.